Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. There won't be any pizza today, unfortunately, so we're very, very oh, really? uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, So we're very, very grateful to the London Institute of Mathematical Sciences for hosting us as usual. Uh, and we're very, very grateful for uh, Professor Yankee Wethaway for taking the time out of his day to lecture us about modern geometry. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I've just, uh, I just I, I realized that after my first two lectures, I'm, gonna fin I'm not going to finish the two lectures. So I'm just going to make it into either four or five, like oh. indefinitely, maybe ten, I don't know. But we just can't, maybe stop when you get bored. But two important announcements. One, right after this, uh, we have our colloquium. Uh, the, our own, the, the London Institute program, which is this really wonderful topic on quantifying machine intelligence with mathematics, which is kind of interesting. There's a colloquium, so there will be drinks, I think, afterwards. And the other important announcement is this Thursday, we have uh, a nice event, which Thomas can tell us about uh, during the mission. So we'll integrate these two things. Thank you. And um, so this, let me just kill this. So just to um, uh, go back a little bit to last time, remember last time we got the number two in uh, four different ways. Just just want to just put it here. What are the four different ways? The first one is if you sum up any convex body that's drawn on S two. So let me call this a. I'm going to write a polytope in S two, and you do. The number of vertices minus the number of ed edges plus the number of faces, you always get two. That's the first method. The, <coughs> which, of course, I've alluded to, this is 20 numbers. So in particular, we use the property that S2 is uninverted from K. So this is that it has only top and bottom betting numbers and nothing in between. First way, uh, we'll go back to the second one. The second way is Gauss. If you integrate the curvature of S2 divided by 4 pi, you get 2. The third way is the transition function. This is important, that S2 is isomorphic to CP1. So it's, it's in fact a complex manifold. And the transition function is this. So if you write a differential form, the derivative you get z squared. All of the pole is 2. 2. The over to the pole, 2. So this, so, okay, so let me just write. So this is Euler. Or the powers of this is. 1, 1, 0, according to the Adenberg McKay property. So these are four ways to get 2. Okay? So today we're going to get four ways to get the number 0. Okay, this, this can go on definitely, right? Next week we're going to get four ways to get the number minus 2. You see what I'm going with this, right? And, and so, but I'm not, I, I stop as if you know, it gets too boring. So, Forget about everything I've said about CP1. I'm going to now consider, for the first time in this lecture, a completely different manifold, which is actually my favorite manifold, because it's the donut. OK? So let's consider the donut. The surface of the donut is a two-manifold. It's a surface. So it's S1 cross S1. But it's a direct product of S1 cross S1. The space for, and that, that, that's the surface of, of, of the donut. So, this calculation for these four different ways is actually much easier for this particular case. Okay, why? First of all, I have to show you this is a manifold. And you think about, well, how do I show that a torus is a manifold? I have to do patchwork, right? But I, you don't even need to do that. It's much easier because this case is so easy. Oh, by the way, the reason it's so easy is because this is I'm not saying, I haven't said the word cloud Yao yet, but this is why the torus is so important. It's the only Yao in dimension one, complex dimension one. And that's why the cloud Yao property is so important. But I haven't defined what cloud Yao means. I'm 
just going through. This is something Euler should have realized, but fair enough, you know, Euler predated Clavier and by 200 years. As smart as Euler was, you know, it's not, yeah. So let's do this. I don't even need to do patchwork because we know the torus is like, the, you know, this is topology one on one. We always did this one when we were five. If you take a piece of paper and you identify this side, and you identify this side, well, you, you do this, that's a, that's a, that's a, call, um, a cylinder, the surface of a cylinder. One more time, it's the torus. Right. If you twisted it, you will get the, um, the, the Möbius strip or the Klein ball. Right? But if you just do the normal way, do this. But this is fine. So we say, but this, so that's it. That, that immediately shows it's a manifold. Because locally, it's just R2. Right. So that will need even to do, do pass. You can if you want to, but you know, mm -hmm. if you're sick enough to do it. I'm not going to do it because I can't remember how many patches are needed. Yeah, anyhow. It's even better because it's not just locally R2, it's locally C because I can immediately put complex structure on it. So in formally, we call torus the quotient of C by discrete lattice. So instead of, instead of considering R2 identified this way and this way twice, you put complex structure on R2, make it into C, and that you can quotient by discrete lattice. I mean, what's a discrete lattice? Well, you know, repeated points. And that's what it means. A lattice is a discrete set of points, and if you just simply identify anything, that's a multiple of each other. So that's, that's this quotient. So that immediately shows that not only is T2 a manifold is in fact a complex manifold for free. So this quotient is very, very important. You can imagine doing this in arbitrary dimensions. If you take Cn and quotient by discrete lattice in dimension n, that's called an abelian variety. So T2 is the first example of an abelian variety. Just to make it into, you know, these are sexy words, right? Ooh, 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 you mean variety. Ooh, but in that sense, what this is just this. Fine. <clears throat> so this is a complex manifold. So again, it's very nice. S2, we showed last time by this um, stereographic projection, um, is CP1 is complexifiable, and but T2 is also complexifiable. Right? That's an abelian variety. So this is good. So now let's get the number zero in the first way, right? Because remember, the first way is if I drew a convex body on T2, and I do this alternating sum, I better get zero. Right, does it? Well, better get zero. And see. Well, whoops. <clears throat> well, I don't need to do anything, because I can't draw a, 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 a convex polyhedron on T2, because it's kind of like, oh, well, I can, but you know, it's going to get a bit funky. Right, I mean, what's, how, do you, how do you do complexity? But because of this property of the abelian variety, I can just literally draw it in the fundamental domain, all right, and a, a convex polygon, and then that's guaranteed to be a convex body on the surface of, of T2. So what does that mean? That means, that means, yeah. Okay, here's an example. This, I've just drawn this, so this is called the fundamental domain of T2. Because what does it mean? It means that I can repeat this plaquette, this little parallelogram, infinite number of times. That's what it means to do the quotient of, of, of C. Right? That's what that quotient in action is. So all I need to do is start drawing something within this fundamental domain. And I can claim, I can draw within this fundamental parallelogram my favorite convex polygon. I, can, I don't have a, I'll give you an example. My favorite convex polygon is the honeycomb because that's what bees do. Right. So let's see, right? So, so here's a hexagram, so hex hexagon, and then this is another hexagon, this is another hexagon. But you should think of it as being identified piecewise, or in, um, according to this. So this edge, this edge, and this edge are, are, are different, but because this is identified with this, this edge is the same as this edge, but this edge, and this is folded over, so this edge is this edge. Right. So on T2, you can always draw a convex, you know, or here was easy, right? Remember the example I gave was any, 
uh, convex poly uh, polytope, right, like the pyramid or, or cube. But on T2, uh, all I need to do is to draw some kind of a periodic tiling of the plane. Right, so that will guarantee when you fold it over, this thing, I can't even picture this anymore, but when this thing folds over, it will be a convex polytope on T2. Okay? Excuse me? Yes. So the sea tiling that you draw on top of your torus have to match the periodicities at all? Because right now it doesn't look like it would glue nicely. Um, yes, it, it must it must obey the periodicity. Mm. So um so so it, it, anything that's repeated this direction must be folded over this way and this way. Yes, so the tiling has to be subtiling over. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So I so in this diagram in particular, there are only three inequivalent inequivalent edges. Right, because this one's the same, this is the same, but these three are, are different. So this is called a uh, tiling tiling of the plane. And if you fold it over, you can imagine yourself some kind of convex body. It's nice, I love this one. Um, I can go on for days just about this particular tiling because it's very clever. By the way, for the physicists, this is actually ending with the four Yamil's theory, but that's a different story. That it really, this really, that's, a, that's a beautiful story. Um, anyway, I won't, I won't go with it. Um, yeah, but now we have it, right? So there are there are there are two vertices because it, within within this fundamental domain there will be two vertices. Um, there are three inequivalent edges, and and you do the sum, you get zero. Okay. If you, now you can think of many other ways to do it. You know, what are the other nice ways to tile the plane? Well, the square tile is, is one. Um, I think that's 2 minus 4 plus 2, I think. Or whatever. Or 1 minus 2 plus 1, or whatever. And then the, the other really nice one that I really like is the square octagon. It, it doesn't have to be right. That's 2 minus 4. You know, just check it. Check it. I like the square, the square octagon one because that's the one. I've only seen that once I in the Cathedral of Turing. When I went to the Cathedral of Turing, there are two things I noticed. One, the Shroud of Turi, you know, one of the greatest relics of Christendom. And the other one is the fact that one is tiled as, as the square octagon tiling. It's a very cute fact. Even the Vatican is um, not this one, but the, the, the square. And I, I don't think I've ever seen a hexagon tiling in any cathedrals. You let me know if you find any. But it's a, no, this is a very fundamental problem. But anyhow, if you do this, any possible periodic tiling, you will always get zero. Because of this very strange property that this zero is the zero of, uh, of, of this alternating sum of volume. Okay, that's purely combinatorial. So now, because we're sophisticated people, we can always rephrase what we've, what we've said in terms of vector numbers. And now if you think about what the Betty numbers are of the torus, well, it's just exactly what the kind of thing you do. Well, how many connected pieces are there in dimension zero? Well, one, there's just, this is a fully connected thing. So that's the one. Now this space is no longer simply connected. Unlike the sphere, because on the sphere, you can always pull off any cycle. But this one is not simply connected. It has two different cycles. Why? Because it's S1 cross S1. Right? So there's this cycle that goes through this direction, and there's the cycle that goes through this direction. So that's why the first Betty number is 2. And there's the class of the entire manifold, because it's, it's a connected piece. So it's a 1 to 1, and if you do 1 to 1, you get 0. Okay. So this is sort of the well, I haven't said anything, just, we're just counting loops, right? We're just counting cycles. This is the most sophisticated way of saying this fact, that this alternating sum should always be zero. Okay. So we're happy, right? We got zero the first way. Okay. So that, it's not so appreciated that, you know, just do any tiling. That, this calculation is the same as the Betty number calculation, but you can just, you can convince yourself. I will show formally how you do it in a minute, but you can see it. Well, that's the first way, right? That's purely combinatorial, that's Euler. 
The second way is Gauss Bonnet. Right? Gauss Bonnet here is really easy because these are abelian varieties, so it's flat. There's nothing to do, right? It's the the, 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 the curvature of a torus is zero because it's locally just a flat thing. By the way, that's the Clavia condition. I'm just keep on because you know I just keep on saying Clavia because it's uh, that's my heart. So you integrate zero, you get zero. So Gauss Bonnet here is much easier. Remember how we did it for the sphere? It was actually a bit of a work. Gauss Bonnet for, for sphere, we've got to write down this metric, write down this Christoffel symbols, and then write this into the, 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 Ricci, the Ricci tensor, and we could then get two. Right? That's a, that's a non-trivial computation. Oh, well, you can do it. You just plug it into Mathematica. Right? It, it's a bit of a mess, but here it's just zero. So integral of zero is zero. So that, that's, how, that's fine. So T2 is Ricci flat. It's complex Ricci flat. Right? In fact, if you just added one more condition, that's it, that will be the definition of Clavier. Yeah. If it's complex Ricci flat and Kähler, and I haven't told you what Kähler is, but I'm going to define Kähler in a minute. And so it's, it's Ricci flat. So that's why you get zero. So done, that's it. I don't have to do anything. So the third method, I promise, is a version of Rimmer Rock. Of course, Rimmer Rock is much more complicated than what I'm saying. But I'm using a, a, a particular corollary of Rimmer Rock, which is to just check the pole of the transition function. Right. The first derivative of the transition function. That, that's essentially, well, the, the cooler way to say that is that is the degree of the line bundle, which is called the anti canonical bundle of the manifold, blah, blah, blah. But you know, that, that sentence only makes sense if you're French. If you're Russian like me, I'll give you some clue. I can say that I'm Russian because my Russian friends say that I'm secretly Russian, because, you know, which is the greatest honor I've ever heard. <laughs> it's just like crazy. Anyhow, um, so gas point has nothing to do. And because T2 is locally, is locally flat, there's nothing to do with the curvature. Sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> it, it has everywhere a non trivial, so that I'm going to even state this particular, a, a, a particularly nice way, and you just keep this sentence in the back of your mind. T2 is locally C, so it has an everywhere, non-vanishing, global, holomorphic one form. Which is that? No poles, nothing to do. So the degree of the transition function is zero. And that's the zero here. This is a corollary of Riemann Roch. In fact, just this sentence, a everywhere, non-vanishing, holomorphic top form is in fact an equivalent statement for Clavianus. Again, I'm not saying Clavianus. So here it's fine, that's how you get zero, and then that's your thing. So the, as, I, as I emphasize, if you want to be like all cool about it, the degree of the anti-canonical bundle is zero. Remember how we got it before for, T, for, 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 for CP1 or S0? We got this, the degree of the anti-canonical line bundle over S2 is two because of that transition function. There's an algebraic way to do it, and I think we're going to get there in a minute. But this is, this is how you get. Uh, so it's almost trivial. OK, one is highly non-trivial, because the analog here is all of the periodic tilings of the plane, including non-periodic. Non, non yeah, so a, a periodic tilings. I was also going to say, no, not include, not include the Penrose tilings, because those are exactly the non-periodic ones. But take any periodic tiling of the plane, you can draw it on a torus, and you can check that sum is always zero, the alternator sum is zero. This is trivial, this is trivial, then S2. Right. This is completely, like, I'm, I'm out of my depth here, because this is not what I, what I work on, but I, you know, every once in a while I spend some time in the evening just try to digest number four, the case four for, 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 for zero. Because, just to kind of show a long story short, the number, the, 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 this fourth way to get the number zero is the beginning of the Langlands program. And I have to emphasize that. It's really, really important that you get this. And I think physicists don't appreciate this so much. You know, I always say, but well, not just me, I mean, people far greater than me, like, you know, Minyoung Kim, he says, you know, 20th century is the century for geometry for physics, the 21st century is the century for number theory for physics. So I encourage all physicists to just go and study number theory with as much passion as you did for geometry. 
And this is just to give you a bit of a flavor of number four for this case, which is completely crazy, and you would never expect this. And you know, I'm this, uh, this is too deep for me, but um, let me of how to get the number four. So I said earlier, CP2, sorry, CP1, S2, is an algebraic variety. We got that as a plain complex curve, right? Remember the, the bottom line. So here, I just want to emphasize this again. So this stuff, so CP1 is algebraic variety. A polynomial of degree one or two in CP2, right? That's what we said last time. In other words, if you write y squared is equal to polynomial p of p n of x, if the degree of this polynomial is one or two, you always get topologically a sphere. So what I want to convince you now is that for T2, you bump this degree up to three and four. You count in pairs. So that, that argument is again doable. So let's just see how T2 is an algebraic variety. This is something, again, physicists didn't appreciate, don't appreciate so much. Newton went ahead and classified these. Did you know? I only recently knew about this. Like, holy crap. Like, you know, remember, y squared is a quadratic in x is the conic sections, right? We're, we remember that when we were, like, in, in, in kindergarten. That's the first thing we learned in kindergarten was that quadratics in two variables are the conic section. So that's classical, that's Apollonius, right? Of course, Descartes had to put that into Cartesian coordinates. But think about, you know, Newton would think about this problem. What if you have a question that's like a y squared to put a cubic equation in x? What are the possible shapes? And Newton came up with like 35 different classifications. It's like, you know, one by one. You can see it's a beautiful text of Newton trying to classify this. And there are some of these. So this is the cubic generalization of quadratics. So this is, again, this is in reals, in real x, real y. So you know, remember, remember you may have seen this in, in, like in school, that, that, that's the cubic. So if you get y squared is equal to x, uh, if you draw y squared is equal to x cubed plus 7, just plot it. Plot that on my that's real, because you know, the square root gives you pieces, right? So what we're going to study now, just like CP1 was the complexification of the conic sections, like circles and ellipses, which gets complexified to spheres. This case, we're going to have to try to somehow complexify this into something. Well, you already kind of see what's happening, right? First of all, I'm adding a point at infinity, so we don't have crazy things like this going off. So you can sort of see these two points coming together. So you're going to sort of get a pair of, pair of you know, circles. And if you complexify, you can sort of convince yourself it's this, which is the torus. This is a very loose way of doing it, and I will do it again in a minute. Of remember, but this this classification of Newton, that he didn't know about in a complex algebraic varieties, but he was really just trying to generalize the conic section. But he already, he, you can already see his classification. You can start seeing you're getting cross sections of the torus. This guy's a genius. Right? He's doing this years before Euler, and 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 and. and and people and remaster. So the complexification here, again, if you consider a, um, um, this in C2, before I projectivize, is y squared is cubic in x, or y squared is the quartic in x, where x, y are in C2, not R2. Well, Riemann tells us the standard trick again, right? You plot all the roots of this polynomial. Where the roots are, it's one to one. Where the roots are not, it's two to one. So that's ramification cover of two to one. So this is called ramification two, just like before. Remember when we did the sphere, we had consider drawing this. And this is Riemann's great trick, which I can't really visualize because you know because you know because Riemann you know because Riemann's Riemann. Remember in this case we had a, if y squared is a quadratic in x where x and y are complex, you have one two sheets. But along the, the branch cuts of these two points is one to one. So if you, if, you, if you paste this together, and then you also add the projective point at infinity, you paste in this, you get the sphere. If you did exactly the same thing, 
but to a degree three or degree four polynomial, imagine placing this together, placing this together, and, and then add a point at infinity. I'm kind of convincing you that it's like adding two little handles, and that's exactly the cause. And I think I've drawn it here. Like this. The, this point is because it's at the point of infinity, because I'm, I'm projectivizing. So bottom line, after this bit of a, you know mental arithmetic, which I still can't really quite visualize, the, the, the take home message is, if you consider a homogeneous, then it is topologically a T2, which is this shape. So we see a pattern, right? If you do a, an equation in three projective coordinates, or two affine coordinates, right? In CP2, if the polynomial is degree one or two, it's topologically a sphere. If it's degree three or four, it's topologically a torus. Um, so the, the three and four is almost indistinguishable because you're adding that extra point of infinity. That's why I'm, I'm, I've drawn this, like, you know, this is sort of projectivized. Otherwise, you get a branch cut that goes off infinity, but I'm just adding that point in to make it look nice. Um, it's exactly the the, uh, the real projection of that would be this classification of Newton. Okay, I'm just pasting these two points together. And so three and four are, are indistinguishable in this sense. Does this give the charge for the branching? Uh, still, still three. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, you, you would. Yeah, good point. Uh, and if I actually wrote this polynomial, I can do the actual piecewise three. Three, right? Well, I'm working in CP2, the three charts in CP2, and, but I'm, I'm adding in one more constraint equation. I think maybe I can paste two of the charts together. But. Fine, so that's, so that's the take home message. By the way, you've just created your first Clavier manifold. That's it, that's it, that's it, right? If I, if I write down x squared, I'm going to write it here, vertically so you can rotate your head. Let's write write something x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed is equal to zero inside CP2 projective x, y, z. That is a clavier manifold. And that's called the, the cubic elliptical, the, the homogeneous Fermat cubic in CP2 as my pet clavier. But I haven't, I haven't defined this word yet, but, but now you know. This is what I play with all the time. But this is actually not the standard form. The standard form is called the Barkov's form. You can convince yourself, and this is a horrendous computation, by the way, that any homogeneous cubic in CP2 can be put after sufficiently thick um, transformation, what's called birational transform. You know, just do coordinate transform until you're blue in the face you can put it into this form, which is this canonical form for the virus transform. So I put, the virus transform is usually, again, you know, I'm constantly switching between C2 and CP2. The difference between C2 and CP2 is that C2 has complex coordinates X and Y. CP2 has projective coordinates X, Y, and Z, just to make everything homogeneous, like milk. Um, yeah, anyhow, just I don't know why that came to my mind, sorry. Um, so it, it, usually the, the virus transform is presented with the Z, the homogenization co uh, coordinate to, to be one. You just have a form that looks like Y squared is equal to X cubed minus four G one X plus G two. So that's the, that's the virus transform. It's not, it's, this is highly non-trivial that you can put every cubic in two variables into this form. Um, I'm just setting Z to 1 for now, just I want to work in C2. I'm constantly switching between C2 and CP2. And the algorithm exists, and it's called the Gauss algorithm, which I think actually comes after Varshav. I think Varshav actually gave the explicit transform that takes every cubic into this form. Y, y squared is a cubic and x, or y squared cubic and quartic into this form. But there is an explicit algorithm. Um, which is horrible. I mean, it's like, can you can imagine how many transforms are needed to get rid of all the, every all of the cross terms? But it exists and makes you really happy. So that's, that's called Weierstrass canonical form. 
And this canonical form is called CP2 as an elliptic curve in C2. Uh, sorry, T2 as an, uh, as an elliptic curve. So this, 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 this presentation of this is called an elliptic curve. Yes, digression. My favorite function in the whole world. It really is, by far, my favorite function in the whole world. This is even more beautiful in sine than cosine. I mean, it, 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 in some sense, this is what sine and cosine are for S2, or harmon spherical harmonics for S2, but this one is the one for the for T2. So you can ask yourself the following question. I, I, I just have to present this to you very briefly because every physicist needs to see it, or every person who hasn't seen it just must see it just once because it's the most exciting function on the planet by far, okay? So, sorry. Um, because, uh, so this is a tribute to Klein in the 1870s, but possibly earlier. I was told by, you know, a car carrying geometers that it's probably known to Gauss, but then again, you know, almost everything's known to Gauss, he just never bothered publishing it. Um, so as I said, now I'm gonna put a complex structure on T2 in the following sense. You can imagine that my lattice that I'm gonna use the quotient C2 with has a degree of freedom. I can, I can scale one of them to be one, but again, the other complex number could be anywhere. So that, that complex number is tau, traditionally called tau, and that tau is the is what's called a complex structure of T2 because it governs the shape. How, how this lattice is actually drawn on C determines how twisted your, your, your torus would be when you do this quotient. So the Weierstrass equation then simply says this, right, With that, because every cubic can be put in this way. And I've said that G2 and G3 are just some complex coefficients, right, in this, in this cubic. But these two coefficients will secretly depend on this tau, this complex parameter. It depends on how tilted your, your lattice is. Okay. So Klein did this wonderful trick. Okay. He defined this function. I, I'm sorry I'm using the whole, most horrible colors. Roman's absolutely right. Never use colors. Just black on white or white on black. Right? Sorry about this. I'm going to read it out. You take the cubic of this coefficient divided by the cubic of this coefficient minus 27 times the square of this coefficient. This is to keep a certain homogene homogeneity of the degree. So why, like, what, what the hell, right? What, what, what the hell? This bottom numerator is zero if and only if this polynomial becomes singular. So what, are, what does that mean? If and only if the partial derivative of this vanishes with the polynomial. So it's the time when the Jacobian vanishes. So this is called the discriminant. Okay. So this is a function, you know, some function, which value, which blows up whenever this elliptic curve becomes singular. Okay. This function, called the Klein J invariant, has a very, very special property. It has the property that any lattice transform does not affect it. It's designed to make this happen. So what does that mean? It means that if I take tau, because you know this is a lattice, right? So it extends itself. If I do any lattice transformation on this on this lattice, this function remains invariant. This is why it's called Klein J invariant. And in other words, this is an invariant on the on the T2 as an elliptic curve. So, for example, I'm just to test. So, what kind of what kind of lattice transformations? Well, tau goes to tau plus one is a transform, right? So just you know, tau, tau plus like this, and you plug it in, you will see that it's an invariant. Other things like if tau goes to minus one over tau, this is also an invariant. Tau times tau plus two, or any other possible transformations on tau, which is linear fractional, will make this remain invariant. And so we we'll remember what the linear, trans linear fractional transformations are. They're the tau going to a tau plus b over c tau plus d 
such that a, b, c, d, this determinant is say plus minus one. Such that a, b, c, d are integers. So any integers that, trans that have this property, and you plug it in into this crazy function, it will always remain invariant. In fact, this is the only function that has this property. It's not a well-behaved function because it's, it's not holomorphic. It's meromorphic because it has poles. But this, so again, everything has a sexier way of saying it. The sexier way of saying it is that the function field of modular invariants is singularly generated by this function. Ooh, that sounds so cool. But if it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It just means this. It means that any function that has this property will be written as a fraction of this function. And this function is, in some sense, the, the deepest, and we're still working on this, there's an entire field devoted to just studying this function. In fact, there's a normalization factor of 1728. This is the reason why Ramanujan, on his deathbed, was able to recognize that 1729 is 12 cubed plus 1, and it's equal to 10 cubed plus 9. They're two different cubics that sum up to this, and that's exactly this normalization. So it wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident. The Roman return is not as, you, as smart as you think he is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. He's like, come on, this guy's gone. I mean, this guy's, yeah, this guy's like, out of control. I mean, he's like, a, you know, party puts Roman return at zero, on, on a log scale, and he puts himself at two, and Gauss at one, right? You can see, like, this guy, I'm, whatever. But, but the reason it was, this function actually has properties. If you do some some sum generalizations, it actually sums up sigma three, which is sums of cubes. It has very very peculiar arithmetic properties. So I just want to say, every physicist must be exposed to this function. Go home, like like just cuddle cuddle this. It, it, there's so much more to, to discover about this prime J invariant. It's it's the it's the most important function ever, like more important than anything else you can ever imagine, because you, it. This, this is a function that traverses every branch of mathematics, like sine and cosine. But it has nicer properties than sine and cosine. Sorry, the, so, where, yeah. where, where does the normalization factor come from? Like, what, what, what is that's it normalized good, to? That's a very good question, and I can't give you an answer right now. I think if you write out the sigma 3 expansion, you will see this. But I'm sorry, I can't give you a better explanation. We can work it out later. <laughs> Let's work it out later. Um, do you know, JK, do you, do you remember why it's 1728? Because we played with it so much, right? There's that 12 cube, which is so essential. Because if it didn't happen, you would lose its belly property or something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. To be, as Thomas would say, to be continued over beer. There will be beer after the, the colloquium, I'm, I'm guessing, right? There's no one. <laughs> so if you want to know more about this, you can write G2 and G3 as Eisenstein series um, in terms of tau. I mean, this is a standard sum, right? You know, um, sum over all non-zero integers of this, of degree 4, degree 6. So these ones are the uh, modular forms of weight, uh, weight, uh, two, um, weight 4 and 6, if you think, or 2 or 3, if you think. Of. So if you, if you plug in this transformation to here, it has a modular property up to some weight. And it's this unique combination that cancels the weight to make it a modular function rather than a modular form. OK, I'm getting too excited about this. Fine, this is right. Um, I just wanted just to entice you. And this is, the, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but every day I try to get a little, a normal way, a little bit more on the J variant. The J function is a function of, of, of tau, right? Do the Taylor series expansion of this for this function. You get this most extraordinary expansion in the history of mathematics. You get one over q. That's the pole I was telling you about. That the, the, this is the pole that detects when the when this, the elliptic curve goes goes singular. The first term is 744. I think people are still trying to understand what that is. The next term is 196,884. And the next one is 21 million. I mean, these are integers. The fact that these are integer expansions is already pretty crazy. That's where all the number theory comes in here. This one is what enabled John Mackay to look at. So wait, I've seen this number before. Has anybody else seen this number before? 
If you know it, you know it. If you don't know it, if you've seen this number before, this is one more than the first non-trivial uh, irreducible representation of the monster group, which is totally crazy. So this is beginning of moonshine. And that's why I say this is, this is a very strange question, function. It touches every single branch of mathematics. I almost know what the function does to. This, this is finite group theory. Why? Or not? I don't know. Um, well, Rich, Richard Borches knows, and he got the Fields Medal for showing that. Just, he, this is like the, the craziest Fields Medal ever. He showed that 196884 is 196883 plus 1. And he got, <laughs> and he got the Fields Medal for that. <laughs> and he got this from this Klein function. But this function wasn't even expanded until much later, right? It was totally crazy. But anyhow, I can go on for it and, 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 and another month just telling you about this side of the story. But all of this, I want to show, just, 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 I want to emphasize here is that this function, which governs the modularity, and that's the word I want to emphasize, of T2, here is just purely geometric. I haven't even gone to the number theory side of it. So go home and just like, it's all on Wiki anyway, just like in these days, we just read Wiki, right? So all of this is on Wiki, and you have a good, anyhow. Go and study J, okay? Just, right? I'm a complete fanatic. If there's like something on this earth you should study, it's the J function. Doesn't matter if you're a physicist, computer scientist, biologist, just go study the J function. It's the, it is the most important function. Uh, you know, if you ask me, like, what's the most important thing? What's the most beautiful equation of mathematics? Well, everybody knows what that is, but that's Euler. E to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta, right? Because that encaptures so much mathematics. Even Atia said that's the most important one. What's the second most important equation in all of mathematics? Is that? Is this function? If it, I mean, it really is in so many levels. Um, and I think that someday somebody will make that statement reverse. Theorem, the most important equation in mathematics is e to the i theta is to cosine theta plus i theta. Theorem number two, the second most important uh, function to mathematics is this j Okay, I digress. So the reason I want to build up is because I haven't told you about the third way to, to do this, to get the number zero. Oh, sorry, four, fourth way. We've done one, two, three to get zero. We're we going to do the fourth way. So I, I want to say this because now we're sophisticated enough to know that T2 is an elliptic curve in CP2. Oh, well, it's an elliptic curve, and in particular, it's an elliptic curve as a cubic, as a Weierstrass cubic in CP2. So this is the sophisticated algebraic geometric way of saying something that's topological. So to cut a long story short, <clears throat> the geometry is trivial in this case. It's Ritchie flat. But the number theory here is highly non-trivial. Okay, so if you do the, exactly the same computation, and this is a theorem, look, look, at, look, at, look at these names, Vey, Dvork, Gordonvik, Hasse, Delinear. Like, I think, well, Delinear showed that this zeta function, you know, this sum, just take an elliptic curve and count over its, its points over at P, this thing would become this. Again, the bottom is exactly as before. It's one, one. That's the two betting numbers of, of the torus, right? And here, this must be a degree two polynomial because the second betting number is two. They're two non-trivial non, non algebraic cycles. So this is the one, one, two of the torus. One plus one minus two is zero. So Delinear Deline proved, so Gordon Dick showed this form. And, because, you know, I think next to Ramanujan, like, God. And then Delinear proved this particular conjecture of Hassan Bay and also got the field medal for, for, for showing this particular form of the numerator. So like, every term here is a field medal work, right? It's not highly non-trivial. It's that hard. And if you write global zeta function, you get zeta after Riemann zeta function times this thing, which is the sum of these terms, which is called the L function. That's, that's, the, that's the essence of what an L function is. It's this non-trivial piece. Remember, for 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 uh, for the uh, for S two we didn't have this problem. For S two the um, for S two the local zeta function was so. For, remember, for a point it's the Riemann zeta function. For CP one it's um, it's that. Right. This is S two. For CP one it's just this this this. Right. There would there was no numerator. Why does new numerator? Because it's it's Eilenberg McLean. There's it's, there's no 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 middle dimensional cycles. It's one zero one. So it's one 
zero, one. There's no odd pieces, no odd cycles. Any odd cycles can be pulled off. In, so S1 is going to be pulled off from S2. So that's why it's zero here. This is one and one. So it's not too exciting. For CP1, the global zeta function is just the product of two Riemann zeta functions. But for T2, we have for the first time seen a non-trivial numerator, and that numerator is degree two. The bottom contributes nothing, so it's two zeta functions. Oh crap, I forgot to put my, um, my, sorry, I forgot my, the two product zeta functions, but then there's another piece coming from the top, right? It's multiplicative, the, the, the order product is multiplicative. So you get the zeta times the zeta times something else that's totally crazy. It's product over all, over all primes of this, right? It's, it's product over primes of some factor that looks like this. So the, the bottom contributes the two zeta functions, but then you gotta take product of a prime of a numerator degree two numerator, which, it, you know, it's some quadratic function taken over all the primes. And that's by definition the L function. So, and that too is the same reason as the two of the two cycles. I mean, that's totally crazy, right? It's, it, it's amazing. And, anyhow, and then, then is this one. You know, there's some coefficient called the AP coefficient or, or Euler coefficient. Of course, I mean, it's got nothing to do with Euler. This is so beyond Euler. But in its honor, it's called the Euler coefficient. I don't know. This is a very particular form. Right. So I think I, I think Rodenbeek showed that this has to be quadratic. This is one degree one. And then Deline showed you have to you have to do this form. And then the product of the primes gives you this function, which you call the L function. So well, I'm sorry, which is this one? Yeah, this one. So that's the L function. Uh, otherwise known as the Hasabe L function. Okay. Are you ready? You ready? Okay, you ready? Nothing up the sleeves? Okay. Okay, this is even, even more exciting than this, okay? This is an Euler product over the primes of this crazy numerator that Deneen showed for Hasse Bay. Well, you know, take the, the you know, it, for, for trivial factors, it's just a room data function. But for this one, you do some expansion. Let's do, let's do this expansion, expand it over n, okay? So why do I write it in this very suggestive form? It's because if this thing was just one minus p to the minus s, that's all the a's are one, that's the Riemann zeta function because of the Euler product. But here I've got something non-trivial, so we, you know, we can write some other coefficients. So this is called the Dirichlet transform. So you write this, the sum version of this is the, so the Riemann zeta function, uh, the, 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 the Euler product is the simplest Dirichlet transform. Okay, just magically fine with them. In general, get some other random crazy coefficients. I should really should have done some examples. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe I could. Oh, mathematically, you can just do, you know, you can count this and just, you know, this might, you know, that's done. Um, because it's a Dirichlet transform, it has very strange properties in this because of product. So, a n times a m is equal to a n m if n and m are co-prime because of this product property. This is very strange. So, that it's called a multiplicative series. Okay, you ready? Okay, before, before you read anything underneath. But this is still 1970s, right? So Deline showed all of this and did all this beautiful stuff. And then boom, comes in Tanya Mashimura, 1957. They did something even crazier. They took these coefficients and instead of doing a Dirichlet transform, they summed this up in a Q series, just like the J invariant. They did the analog of putting instead of 744, 196, blah, 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 to a Q expansion. They put in this AN here. This same AN, which comes from the product of the L function, like this. And they made this crazy conjecture known as the Taniyama Shimura conjecture, which is that this Dirichlet transform of the L function of any some conditions, it's smooth at least, elliptic curve will transform to a modular form of wave two. That's totally crazy. Like what the hell, right? This has nothing to do with anything. 
And Robert Langlands noticed this and said, this is so crazy that it, this is whatever the, this is doing is linking number theory to geometry, to topology, to arithmetic, to everything. And this, this observation of Taniyama Shimura is the beginning of the Langlands program. And this, this is again, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but I believe that the clavialness of the elliptic curve is, is central to this, to this. You really need some kind of rigid flat, or at least some kind of pavilion variety property to make this happen. So what, is it, what, what does this mean? It means, okay, let's just backtrack and see what we've actually done, right? I've told you to do this crazy thing. Take the Weierstrass elliptic curve, right, which is T true, which we know, we, we know what that is, is this space. We can write it as an algebraic variety, as a cubic equation in three variables. In this thing, it's an algebraic equation, it's a polynomial, so I can count the number of zeros over FPR. Right? And then I can sum up in this generating function, this number is just some sequence of integers, and do this particular sum. Once I've done this sum, I take the exponential. It's a bit nuts, right? Take the exponential, and this will guarantee you that this exponential always becomes a rational function. That's already crazy. In other words, this sum will always be logarithmic. It will be a rational function, and it's a rational function of a very specific form. For T2, it will always be these two on the bottom, which are governed by the, Betty, the even Betty numbers. And the numerator is always of this form, which is governed by the odd Betty number. That's why it's degree two. And then I'm going to do something else that's crazy. I'm going to take the product of a primes over this expression. These two become trivial. They become Riemann zeta functions. But the top becomes this function, which is called the L function of this form. But because I'm taking the product of all the primes, I can do Dirichlet transform and get these coefficients. It's just numbers. I, I should have shown you some examples on stage. It's just play with it. It's like some crazy numbers. One. 7, 0, 2, whatever. It's not even increasing, just some no. And then Taniyama Shimura says, let me create a new function with these coefficients, but summed over some q to this, to, you know, q formally equaling to this. Then I get this new function. This sum converges, and it converges to a particular um, function which has the property. So what, what does it mean, modular form of weight 2? It means if you plug the lattice transformation that I was talking about, because this is a T2 after all, or A, B, this, this lattice transformation, if you plug this in to this form, you will get the same function, but with the multiplicative factor of 1 over C tau plus D to the power of 2. That's, that's called weight 2 modular form. It's not weight zero, because we know the weight zero one is only the J-invariant, and this doesn't sum to the J-invariant. It sums to something else. For every elliptic curve, every smooth elliptic curve, you, you always get some new modular form or corresponding modular form of weight two. Okay? So this is the fourth way to do it. And I always like to use this. Proof. See Andrew Wiles, 1994. 1995, and now it's called modularity theorem. That's, that's why Andrew, well, he would have gotten the field tonight, but unfortunately, he turned 40 on the day that the proof was printed. It's really sucks. It's like, so I, I, I mean, look, look at this, right? Every single person who was ever involved in this work got the field medal. Right? Every single step was another field medal. Right? Recognizing this was quadratic, got him the field medal. Recognized it, well, much more than, but Gordon Lee is a genius anyway. Delinia recognized that it's factorized. This one gets the field medal. And Joao's shows that this modularity transformation gives a weight two, in fact, weight two cusp form, gets the fill, well, didn't get the fill's medal because it turned 40. But um, he did get a plaque from the Fields Institute, the only one, the unique one. He's the only person in history to not get a Fields medal but still get a commemorative plaque, like a little one. You're so special. Because, so he proved, so he proved this one. If you just did it a year earlier, like if you were born a year earlier, would have been called the field medal first for sure. So I have no idea what the, so this is a 250, the famous 250 page proof, which got occupied the entire volume of Anos Mathematics. Before, before I die, I would like to understand that entirety. Just, I get some vague ideas of why, you know, but you know, it's, 
it's not my field, but it's, it's really so. Every physicist needs to digest pieces of that somehow. So, let me just finish up. Why is, this, why is this important? Because an important corollary of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture for Euclid curves, the, you know, this fourth way of getting zero, or now known as the, the Wiles Broy Taylor Conrad modularity theorem, a very important corollary of this is from Atlas theorem. That's why it's so important. Roughly, this is uh, you know, this is about as much as I understand it. Um, the the general argument of why Taniyama Shimura implies Fermat is as follows: Some guy called Frey in the 1980s noticed that you can construct for a to the n plus b to the n plus c to the n what's known as the Frey elliptic curve of this form, and it's just a, it's just just a contra contradiction argument. He showed that if such a curve existed, it would violate the modularity conjecture or the modularity theorem. Details to be to be continued. Uh, but basically, the, the powers of n are so high that this elliptic curve would violate. If, if a and b, if integers a and b and c existed, this elliptic curve would, uh, if you do this transform exactly as I said, you know, you, you know, this step, get the L function, get this, get this, get the L function, get the Dirichlet transform, get the Taniyama Shimura transform, get this function, you check, oh no, wait, it's not an elliptic curve of, um, it's, it's not a, um, a, 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 a cusp form of, of weight two, therefore this curve cannot exist, therefore for that. That's why it's so important. Uh, and this is just one, one of the consequences, right? Um, this, you prove this, you prove 350 year old conjectures, and then they'll become correlates. You know, ABC conjecture is likely to be something of this form. You know, it's, it's, it kind of fits in there. Unless you're Mochizuki, who's just totally crazy. And then, I don't know, nobody believes, I don't know what, any, any. Um, sorry. We're, we're, I think it's a good time to take a break. Before, before I like that, get too excited. Yeah, 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 okay. So it goes in sequences of two. And so this, this, the, 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 the bottom line of this is that we say chi is two minus two g. So where chi is now called the Euler number. So the Euler number of a sphere is two minus two times zero. That's where you get the first two. The Euler number of the torus is two minus two times one. That's the zero. Okay. And that's so important because you can see that the torus is the only case when this number goes to zero. So that's the first way, which is purely topological from the torus. Second way, if you integrate all of these higher ones, you can convince yourself, just, just do the metric, I'm not going to do it, I can't do this in public. Um, uh, you could always get a negative number, and it's this sequence. The third way, you can check that the degree of the anti-canonical bundle is always negative in this sequence. And finally, the zeta function, you have to trust me on this, is again of the form 1 minus t, 1 minus pt, the local zeta function, times the polynomial of degree 2k or 2, 2g. I'm sorry, this is, this is g. And that's it. So that's the four ways of getting on this practice. So, summary. The take-home message. Let's summarize what we've done in this terms of these four stories. Here's the question. Why would you ever do this? Remember the first way we did this alternating sum? This was a question that was really proposed to me by Minyo Kim. He says it's a very unusual thing to do. Like, what? I mean, of course, you know, it's Gauss. I mean, it's, it's Euler, right? Euler's a genius. But why was he thinking about this? Why would he even imagine this? Well, well, I've kind of alluded to this fact because he kind of, you know, it's, a, it's an inductive proof why, you know, for, 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 for a polytope, why this is true. You remove an edge. It's equivalent to removing a face and removing two, you know, that, that kind of move. But it's still, but that was Euler. He was thinking about this problem purely topologically because he was, at the time, he was thinking about this, uh, the, 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 the bridge of Königsberg. That's why he was thinking about this kind of problems. But Minion Kim says, what is the true deep reason? The reason that Minion was asking me this is because I tried to advocate to him as much as I tried to advocate to Thomas is that machine learning can detect all of these patterns. And Mignon says, can it ever detect something as crazy as this? So far, I'm not, I don't know. I don't have evidence either way. But here's the question. 
We'll, we'll find out at the seminar at 1.30. We'll find out at the seminar at 1.30, or no, we'll find out at the drinks after the seminar at 2.30. Um, but I, at least I think, having played around with it, uh, here's a question for the, for the people in the audience. If you know it, no, don't, don't, uh, don't say it. What mathematical structure has this alternating sum built in? What natural mathematical structure has this plus minus sign built in? Take a wild guess. I don't know, but at least this is my opinion, but at least I think this is a natural way of getting it. It starts with H and then has an A in it. No takers? Or at least I think the natural mathematical structure that has this plus minus sign is homological algebra. I see the, the, the pure mathematicians are like, you appreciate it. I, I think so. Why? It is, why? Isn't cheating though? It is cheating. Because he, that's how he got like, to a basic problem. In the way, but I know it's certainly, you're right. Certainly Euler wasn't doing this. Yeah. But at least because of this, yeah, that, yeah fine. fine. <laughs> yeah. But at least it's okay. Fine. It's, maybe this is a private joke now. But I think that the natural mathematical structure that has this kind of thought is homological algebra. And that is the key, actually, to all of this. So you'll see that um, uh, Gas Bonnet um, is a special case of Atiyah Singer. And Rimmel Rock is also a special case of, uh, I guess, Gordon B. Rimmel Rock and, 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 and um, Index Theorem. And this, the Hasebei story, is natural consequence of analytic cohomology. So all of these proofs, in all, in all of these four ways of getting these numbers to be these integers, all have an underlying homological structure. And that is why we're able to do it. So I'm, I'm, fairly, co I'm fairly comfortable with you know, Durham and, 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 and Hodge uh, structures in terms of homological structure. The most mysterious one is, to me is Aladic cohomology. And I think I won't really understand that. But check me out in couple of years time and I'll finally understand. Somebody please explain to me what the hell Gordon Dick was thinking in, ex uh, in, in, in um, introducing analytic cohomology. But that, that is the, the, the key proof to, 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 of, of the linear of Hasebei. So that somehow this structure all comes down to homological algebra. So the third most important thing that every physicist should learn is homological algebra. Um, I think actually somebody said, I think it was, it was Cartan, or I think it's Cartan. Cartan gave a famous lecture in, 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 in Oxford in 1930, one of his big name lectures. And he said, the most important equation in mathematics is d squared is equal to zero. <laughs> right, I think he said, I, I think it's Cartan. Um, I think it's Cartan? I can't remember. Somebody, well, it's, it's quoted in the beginning of every homological algebra textbook. I, I think it's Cartan. Um, so very quickly, I think people are more or less familiar with some form of homology, right? which is um, basically what you have, and I'm not going to specify, the, the important thing is to not to specify which homology, and that's the key. There's a universality theorem, again, due, due to Gordon D, of different homologies, I mean, yeah, everything's good to Gordon D, that this structure is universal, so you don't, don't worry about whether it's Dirac, or it's, 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 it's um, a simplicio, or singular, or alladic, they roughly have the same kind of be categorical, I hate to use this word, I know JK loves it, they have the same kind of categorical behavior. So basically, I'm not even going to specify what C means. Um, I'm just going to say, let there be a complex, which is on this form, which you can just think about as a sequence of maps between vector spaces, vector, you know, indexed by some integer n, such that there are maps between them call them boundary maps, co-boundary maps, D maps, derivative, doesn't matter. It just, that, and this boundary map has the property that D squared is good to zero. So this is Cartan's statement that this is the most important thing in mathematics. Well, in my opinion, I beg to differ. I think this is the third most important thing in mathematics. <coughs> so, whatever, think about this as vectors, just think, what's a chain, what's a chain complex? Doesn't matter. Just think of this as this particular sequence of vector spaces, where um, I'm, not, uh, I'm just in between every pair of vector space, 
there is a map which squares to zero. So the composition of this map with this map is zero, pairwise. Um, I've also, it's customary to put zero and zero on the two ends, uh, where this zero, this is the trivial inclusion map, you just include zero into the first vector space, and this is the trivial projection map where you take everything here to zero. So now we have a nice little um, bonbon. You've got nice two ends with a little bonbon, and everything in between is the, the sugar. So this is the sugar, and that's it. So this is homological algebra in one line. That's what, what, so what the hell has this got to do with anything, right? This is just a sequence of vector spaces. And much of modern geometry, or actually much of modern mathematics, is about studying the structure of this sequence of maps. In particular, I like to call this the DNA of modern geometry. Why? Because it's a double-stranded object. It's literally, it's true. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a double sequence, right? So there, there are two parallel sequences. One is this. Okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm secretly telling you what this is. So, so I've written the Durand complex on top, or the Fisher complex on top, where you have cycles, I keep on telling you, cycles of each dimension. And this goes this way as boundary operators. So if you think about, like, if you think about a, um, a, um, um, a, a ball, right, the boundary is the sphere, and the boundary of the sphere is null. So the double boundary of the ball is nothing. So that, that d squared because it's zero. So the boundary of a boundary is nothing. So this, uh, so this sequence goes this way, and that's purely geometrical. Right. I was talking to some Buddhist about this. I thought it was like, this, some, this is some deep stuff in Buddhism, right? The boundary of a boundary is, is, is nothing. Right. It's like totally zen. But I, <laughs> but, um, anyhow, like, like, I, I'm trying to like even convert like religious leaders to do this, right? Because it's, everybody needs to be doing this, right? So this is, you can think about this as this sequence. But what about this one on this hand? Well, in the case of Durham, so this is like really nice. I'm introducing Durham homology in one slide just because it's playful. This is supposed to be a playful introduction, right? This one, on the other hand, is how to put forms on cycles. So, right, <clears throat> I told you on the torus, I can put a one form. I just put dz. Take your coordinate, do dz. Right? Or you take your one cycle to dz. Uh, if you took, like, take, a, take an n-dimensional object, do dz1 wedge dz2. No one would have the d. So this one has this op this it goes in this direction, and again, it's a sequence of maps. You can think of both, both you can think of both as part of a, a chain complex, but uh, you can show that this d squared is also equal to zero. We, we know this statement for Durand because in, in calculus we learned grad of div is zero, and the div of grad is zero. So this is the generalization of that statement. So here is Zen Buddhism on top. The boundary of a boundary is, is null. Uh, bottom is Christianity. I forgot the reason why. Um, it's because <laughs> the, 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 the operation of an operation is now. So maybe, it, uh, after a few beers, I can tell you why I think this is Zen Buddhism. <laughs> this bottom is like Catholicism. But, okay, so that's these two sequences. You can always pair them up. So this is, called a, this is a homological sequence. This is called a cohomological sequence. So this, but they both go under the name of homological algebra. So this is homology, this is cohomology. Why is it cohomology? Because this is purely geometrical, and this is operational. You can define some kind of operator on the cycles. And then, so what, so, so what the hell? So, what, so what's this good for? This is what this is good for. Because d, pairwise d, d squared is zero, you can define the kernel of one over the image of another. Why can you do this? It's because the image of this is inside here, right? <clears throat> but, but you can't guarantee the image of this is in the curve of this. But because d is zero, so this actually lives inside curve. So you can do this quotient. That's what I'm gonna say. So the, the point is, because d squared is equal to zero, you can always take the kernel or the, the zero set, or the, the, you know, the set that maps to zero of this one, quotient it by everything that maps into here. So that's, that's it. This is all of homology. So, so what I've defined for you here is the homology of, of a sequence. So for example, the top is simplicial homology. 
At the bottom, if you do the same trick, this is cohomology, and in particular, Durham cohomology. You can complexify it. When you complexify this whole story, it's called Hodge structure. And you can do like double cohomology. Right? That's why this is like, you know, so like, so, so cool. That's all I'm going to say. That's, that's it. I don't, I don't want to read, because you can read it up. Uh, all the all the stuff. I just want to give you a, a vision. Why, why? So why have I described this? Is because, believe it or not, this division is the reason why Euler has this. And of course, this is a private joke. In some sense, this structure is designed to make sure that works. So just to, <clears throat> everybody, have you, you probably have all seen some version of this, or most of you have seen some version of this, but probably not in, in this completely non-rigorous and playful manner. But I just want to show it's a completely playful manner. It's because it took me years to get to this point, to realize, wait a minute, oh my god, I can't, like, if you read, like, I don't know, um, Bot, or, 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 or Hartshorn, or, or, or Griffith, you just want to cry because that, oh my, you know, like after 20 pages of definitions, you just want to cry. But no, it's all they're trying to do is some sense trying to make a natural case for Euler. And this is kind of the, the natural repeating construction of that. Is. Well, it's more, it's more. I mean, okay, it's DNA, right? So there must be, must be bonds between this, right? So what do you think the bond is? So think about this as a geometric object. Think about this as a cohomology. So the geometric objects are cohomological objects. The derivatives or operators are called cohomological objects. And what do you think the bond is between the DNA? Well, do I? Oh, yeah, you, in, in, integration. <laughs> integration. You can always take an n form and integrate it over an n cycle. This is just normal integration. You know dx, dy, dz better have a triple integral because there's a dx and a dy and a dz. So you must be integrated over three-dimensional objects. If it's dx, dy, it must be integrated over two-dimensional objects. So <clears throat> the, the bond here is exactly the statement that um, um, a R form can be integrated over an R chain, it doesn't matter. An R differential can be integrated over an R-dimensional object. And this integral is called a period integral. That's called a period. So this is called a geometrical period. So Gordon-Dick, again, <laughs> amazingly, the Gordon-Dick um, period conjecture says that for interesting geometric objects, this integral will always be in interesting <laughs> combinations of pi and zeta value. So that's the Gordon-Dick uh, period conjecture. I have no idea what means Gordon-Dick. I don't know, whatever. I don't know. Uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> As some, I think there's a, this is a beautiful paper by um, um, uh, Don Zaki, where he explains what, where this might come from, but it's too deep for me. I need more years of my life to understand Zaki. But so that's called a period integral. This is again a very, very important integral. You know, part of the Hodge conjecture, all that stuff comes, comes be packaged into this. But for us, it's just as exactly to say a duality between geometric objects and a differential object because you can pair them up and do this integral. And again, surprisingly, because of this whole structure I've been trying to dis describe, it encodes incredible information about number theory. Why? I don't know. You need to be like really wise. But in this form, we all know Stokes' theorem from calculus. Right? Stokes' theorem says if you integrate something over a object, roughly, is the same thing as integrating the uh, sorry, if you integrate the derivative of some object over um, or something, it's the same thing as integrating that object over the boundary of that object. Right? That's Stokes' theorem, right? Um, so think about Stokes' theorem is in various guises. Uh, Gauss's theorem is the triple integral of the of the of the div of of a vector field of V is equal to the double integral of V over the boundary. That's Gauss's theorem, that Gauss's divergence theorem. If you think about Stokes' theorem, the double integral of the curl of a vector field is the same as the single integral over the boundary of the vector field. Right, so 
Green's theorem, right? And whatever, right? But the, the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can always take out a derivative and cancel one integral, right? So Gauss divergence, Green's theorem, Stokes theorem, all that stuff is just this statement that whatever you do, a homological um, object, take the d of that, integrate, uh, sorry, a cohomological object, integrate that over a homological object, the geometry, you can always cancel the d and move the d down to the boundary of that object. Even the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Fundamental theorem of calculus says the integral of f dash between an integral a and b is f at b subtracted by f at a. Why is that? Why is the minus? That minus comes from homological algebra. It's the same minus, right? because you need to make this make. So this is what I'm saying is something very very simple. That of course this is a super sexy way of saying fundamental theorem of calculus is just. Um, it's the property of this period integral between homology and cohomology. So that's why it's re it really is deep. I mean, it took so many people so many years to work on this. So an integral is a linear form, right? So you can, you can write this. It's a bilinear form. So you can write a pairing. This is the duality we're saying between a homological object and a, co -hom a cohomological object, the derivative, and a homological object, the geometry. And this is a, a pairing. It's a bilinear, non-degenerate pairing, so it's an inner product. And Stokes' theorem, or any fundamental theorem of calculus, simply says, I can take this d, I move across the comma, it changes into the del. In other words, in, with respect to the period integral in geometry, homology and cohomology is exact the statement that d and del are adjoint operators. And that's why it's so pretty. Um, <clears throat> the, so that's one duality. The other duality is Poincaré duality, which you know shows that you can do that. That's essentially the statement that this is symmetric, that this the uh, the DNA is symmetric, the bonbon is symmetric this way. So it's paired this way, that's the DNA bond, and it's symmetric this way, due to um, uh, you know some. I think there's a motivic explanation for that, but uh, but not, no, 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 never mind. Okay. So th this is super nice, right? I mean, you've been deceived all your life into thinking like that fundamental theorem of calculus and Green's theorem, you know, all that stuff you did your first years, like you like you like, oh my God, I have to memorize these three, four different. No, it's the, the, that, that's that's it, that's it. Uh, fundamental theorem of calculus is just a, a, a cheap way of telling you that there is a period integral which is a nonlinear which is bilinear non degenerate form, and um, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the, the boundary operator and the differential operator are adjoint operators with respect to this pair. That's so cool, right? I love, you know, one thing I love, really enjoy doing is to tell, like, younger people in the, the, the sexiest and most sophisticated way possible what they're actually doing. So I want my, my you know, I want my four-year-old to go to class, like, tomorrow and say, you know, surely what you're teaching me is the operations of a finite field, right? Are, are you telling me, you know, like, you know, what they do, like, you know, kids, like, work on budget, you know, like, how do you read a clock, right? You read a clock because you're working in, 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 in well, it's actually not even a field, but it's a, a cyclic group of order 12, right? So you're doing modular 12 arithmetic, but it's not, I know, I want my kid to say, but this is not a field because 12 is not prime. I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, that's what reading the clock is, right? So I'm saying that fundamental, fundamental theorem of calculus, which you learned like in like, you know, last year in high school, is just a special case of this duality pairing of a period in the grand geometry. And it's much deeper than, this is just layer number one of Langlands in some sense, right? Because there's so much more dualities that, that that's why the Langlands program is the unifying program of all, all of my minds. So this is just layer number one in some sense. I have seven minutes. So okay, we can now now okay. I think I think we've we, uh, we've covered all the technical stuff. So I can just draw pretty pictures, right? So. Um, to summarize, we go back to Euler's classification that all smooth orientable surfaces that have no boundaries and no punctures is characterized by a single integer called the genus. Okay. And you do this crazy combination 
2 minus 2 times this. This integral, I mean, so this combination should be exactly the alternating sum of the Betty numbers. Why alternating sum? That's because this alternating sum is, is exactly the dimension of these kernels. Right, it's, it's a you know, dim of this, it's a dim of top minus dim of below because they're quotient spaces. So that's you, you get a natural minus sign. I'll show you in a minute why this works. And in particular, this chi for Euler, it should be E, I don't know why they call it chi, but anyhow, of chi for Euler is called actually the index of H dot or H upper dot. So uh, what do I mean by H dot and H upper dot? Because every time you have a sequence like this, it's customary to write geometric objects as H lower dot, meaning homological objects. And H upper dot is the cohomological object, which is this one. And you can literally just look at this chain complex and say the index of this chain complex is called the Euler number. So now that divorces completely from geometry. We're no longer talking about Euler numbers of geometry. We're now talking about purely algebraic construction. So and that, uh, uh, guess who's responsible for this, right? Bubaki, right? Because Bubaki don't think in terms of geometry like Penrose does. Um, maybe that's a theorem, like Russians and English people think in terms of pictures, and the French think in terms of structure. <laughs> I think about, like, you know, all these, like, crazy French philosophers, like, I know, Derrida, uh, um, Lacan, and all these people, they think about structure, right? I have no idea what they say, but it just sounds cool. They want to express structure. They want, yeah, <laughs> oh, well, yeah, 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 but by creating more structure. Maybe that is a very French way, I don't know, whether you know, ha, ha, who here is French? You're German. What? No. Sorry? No, no, no. <laughs> I would not know. You know, yeah, I wish there were some French PhD student who would come from. Oh, wait, um, Dimitri. He comes from the French school. He fled. I think the King's people fled today. That's why they stole pizza. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, so, so the Euler, Euler number is now seen as the index of a cohomological chain or a, homo a co homological or homological chain, chain complex. So, and so this is a purely algebraic description of something very, very, very simple, which is you take some convex object drawn on these surfaces, you do plus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus. Right? You can't do more than plus, minus, plus, because this is dimension 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, that's it. Of course, imagine if you could do the higher, higher dimensions, you can do plus, 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 minus, plus, minus. And that, that alternating sum comes from the fact that it's an underlying um, homological algebra. Um, okay, so fine. So this is Euler's classification. So that's one. Two, I've shown you explicitly in this case and this case, these two are not just real dimension two manifolds, because I showed you patchwork, but they're in fact complex one folds. So when you put complex structure on these, it's called a Riemann surface. So these are not just two dimensional real objects. They're complex one-dimensional objects. They're called complex manifolds of complex dimension one. So this will usually be denoted as sigma. And I've shown you even further that these objects are not just complex manifolds of complex dimension one or complex one-fold. They are complex algebraic varieties explicitly as degree one and two, degree three and four, polynomials in CP2. So they are hypersurfaces of given degree in CP2. They're they're complex plane curves, algebraic curves. So they're generalizations of, this is the generalization of the conic section. This is the generalization of Newton's classification of cubics. And I haven't shown you all the higher ones work as well, but you can trust me. Okay, I'm gonna, that, that's something I don't want to do in public. Mm -hmm. right, that's just to get a bit messy. And maybe I'll just finish here. I'll finish. Um, 